good evening uh good cynthia saruna pirmal madam and uh, good evening my dear students i welcome you all to another session of raisa dnb online academic activities today today we are going to deal with a very important and professionally as well as academically very very relevant significant topic that is pre anesthetic evaluation of a non cardiac patient for a non cardiac surgery whether you like it or not this is the scenario which most of us will be facing uh, almost every week uh, in our career so and in your exams as madam rightly said and even our professor will agree with me that this is going to be one of your major case and very important question uh, in your theory exams also so it's very important i request all of you to make full use of our madam gurusanthya dr gurusanthya madam's effort and i hope this session is going to next coming to us is going to be very useful for all of you over to santhya madam thank you yes sir uh, good evening all um, as usual i'm dr guru santhya and today i'll be presenting about pre anesthetic evaluation and risk stratification and risk reduction in patients who are cardiac patients and coming for a non cardiac surgery i i'll just minimize my screen just a second okay so so why are we so much concerned about we are not talking about any patients who's having a, a renal disease alone any patient who's had, having a ckd again it's it's a concern but day in and day out we are worried about pre operative evaluation of cardiac patients post op for non cardiac surgery it it is why because these patients present to us in a very larger number nowadays prior to these days where the healthcare was not so much evolved these patients might have died prior or their healthcare may not be good for adapting them to a high risk surgery or an intermediate surgery for that case even a low risk surgery in them the mortality and perioperative morbidity including heart failure and perioperative myocardial infarction is seemingly very very high and hence they have formed a guidelines may be an american guidelines or a canadian guidelines or an european guidelines to guide us how to take these patients for any non elective or emergency non cardiac surgery so what are the spectrum of cardiovascular diseases which we will be touching upon today is first is hypertension ischemic heart disease the patients with coronary stents any patient who's got a cardiac failure any patient with a valvular abnormality with the cardiomyopathy or rhythm abnormality any patient uh, sir Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, ma'am. We are able yes, to hear you. No, someone just message saying that uh, audio is yeah, not. Yes, professor. Now, this time, sir, audio is is not able to get the audio. Okay, sir. So, I think okay. he has to reconnect with his audio device. Okay. Um, should I try increasing my volume here? No. If possible, little bit. If possible, little bit more, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Otherwise, uh, it's clear. Otherwise. Just a second, sir. Um, now is it okay sir prostatic valves and their concerns in the perioperative period and in the preoperative evaluation whether you are, whenever you are seeing a patient you will always look for what is the presenting complaints of the patient and that you will always assess for personal history which will include smoker and alcoholic intake which may actually give us a clue about the uh, presenting underlying uh, cardiac conditions which the patient might have got pertaining to the cardiac etiology what are the history and the examination we should look for is four cardinal cardiovascular symptoms which should include chest pain angina palpitations and syncope and one important point which one should not forget is effort tolerance so whenever you are assessing a patient you always ask if they are in, able to climb one flight of stairs without dyspnea or a or if in any patient has got a uh, underlying ischemic heart disease ask them if you are uh, able to walk on a level ground without getting any dyspnea at least for some 600-700 meters suppose if they say that they have got effort intolerance if they, they stop for even climbing one flight of stairs then that is a red flag sign which you should have in your mind when you are assessing any cardiac patients posted for non cardiac surgery you should also assess the history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea orthopnea and any history of prior drug intake for cardiovascular diseases and uh, peripheral vascular diseases so what is the proposed procedure 
non cardiac procedure whether it is a high risk surgery or intermediate risk surgery or low risk surgery what are the medications that the patient is on and how do you risk stratify and how do you mitigate the risk and one important dire question which one must not forget to ask is whether to proceed with non cardiac surgery first or whether to proceed with cardiac surgery first or should we evaluate further so in the evaluation of cardiovascular symptoms to know if the patient might have got an underlying cardiac disease we should always probe the history of smoking hypertension hyperlipidemia advanced age and any patient who's got a chest discomfort or angina equivalent which may be effort intolerance dyspnea on exertion or dyspnea at rest uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and all should point out towards your um, uh, underlying unknown ischemic heart disease and the patient with known ischemic heart disease any patient who has got a chest discomfort and angina equivalent any angina and effort tolerance must be brought into consideration in a patient with the known ischemic heart disease and uh, before moving on to any further one should understand our uh, whole chapter of cardiovascular diseases will always focus on whether do you need the surgery at an emergency basis or an urgent basis or it can wait depending upon the patient's condition whether you have to proceed as an emergency basis or not for that you have to classify the surgery as emergency surgery wherein any limb saving or life saving procedure is an emergency surgery which must be done within 6 hours and no time will be there for you to optimize the patient whereas you can mitigate the risk if you act very prudently like any patient who has got a vascular injury for a lower limb or upper limb wherein if you wait for 6 hours or wait for an echocardiography or a fasting guidelines to come then the patient may lose their limb or life so such cases it is taken as an emergency basis and should be taken within 6 hours any surgery like hip fracture or bowel obstruction which should be taken less than 24 hours and there is like quite time to optimize in between any surgeries like that will be considered as an urgent surgery any surgery which is oncological major oncological surgeries or time sensitive surgeries because if you wait for more than 6 weeks then the risk of metastasis may be very high but if you have to have time for optimization you can optimize up to 6 weeks if their cardiac conditions demands them and then you can take after 2 to 3 weeks provided that the surgery can wait and another is a elective surgery so it can wait for indefinite number of time like lipoma which is not infected sebaceous cyst which is not infected inguinal hernia which is not obstructed like that so elective surgeries can wait for an indefinite period next thing to consider is the risk category of a non cardiac surgery it will be classified as low risk intermediate risk and high risk from here on i'll be talking as only mace mace is major adverse cardiac events without considering the anesthetic factors without considering the patient factors the surgery itself is associated with risk of mace and that is how you classify low risk surgery as low risk of mace that is less than 1% risk of mace intermediate surgery as 1 to 5% risk of mace and high risk surgery as more than 5% risk of mace any major vascular surgeries aortic surgeries over uh, open lower limb vascular surgeries and whipples total adrenalectomy or cystectomy esophagectomy liver transplants and repair of intraperitoneal bowel repair all that will come under high risk category of surgery whereas the surgery itself performing the surgery itself is associated with more than 5% risk of mace so then comes the individual diseases per se first we'll discuss about hypertension uh, according to acc aha guidelines in 2017 any blood pressure of more than 130 bar 80 is considered as hypertension and when you are assessing a patient with hypertension you should always determine whether the hypertension is primary hypertension or secondary hypertension the secondary hypertension may be because of a primary renal disease or it can be because of a chromocytoma or the patient might have got a chronic disease kidney disease which may have preponderantly triggered or a cushing syndrome or hyperthyroidism and the cause for sec or renal artery stenosis all that has to be ruled out when you are seeing a patient with primary hypertension and patients with hypertension if the hypertension is not controlled over a period of time it may lead to left ventricular hypertrophy ischemic heart disease chronic kidney disease 
intracranial hemorrhage and peripheral arterial disease any patients with prolonged periods of hypertension in the interim period when they are posted for an intermediate or high risk non cardiac surgery it is always prudent to rule out the end organ damage by looking at the ecg which may show a left ventricular hypertrophy or a left ventricular strain pattern and creatinine which may show an end organ damage from the kidneys and it may have a chronic kidney disease pattern which is a hypertensive nephropathy and these patients may be on medications like ac inhibitors or arbs in the perioperative period it is prudent to stop them 24 hours prior because uh, continuing them is associated with intraoperative hypotension and it is also very very imperative to start them in the post operative period after 24 hours when the hemodynamics has been uh, okay and all right so suppose you have a patient for uh, elective hernia repair so the patient on table is having a bp of 200 and 120 so do you defer to do the case under spinal anesthesia or do you proceed so this type of decision making will always come when you are doing case in a corporate setup or wherever you are doing it so the hypertension can itself be because of withholding any antihypertensives the patient is previously on or the patient might be a anxious patient so once you rule out that the patient is um, anxiolysis you've given till then the bp is high whether to proceed or not will depend upon individual case to case basis it is not like whenever you have um, a hypertension you immediately defer the case if the bp is somewhere around 200 and 120 should you immediately defer a case based on one bp reading alone there are no consensus which says if you defer a case for bp of 200 and 100 suppose you do it at the next week after optimization is it associated with an improved perioperative outcome no there are no guidelines which have said that you deferring a case because of a single uh, or because because of a serial hypertensive value if you defer and do it at a later stage if it is associated with a good outcome no but when we are doing a major case but then where it involves a large volume fluid shifts the process the bp is consistently high and if you think that is going to alter the disease course or the morbidity and mortality of the patient then you may try to defer a case else based on a single one or two bp reading if you should defer a case you should think twice when the bp is more than 180 bar 110 but always the consensus is when to defer when the bp is 180 bar 110 one should always keep in mind deferring does not improve the outcome so coming on to ischemic heart disease one should always try to find out if the patient is having an undiagnosed ischemic heart disease that can be very well determined by what are the previous symptoms i told like uh, clues with the patient have, can have patient is a smoker advanced age having chest discomfort any uh, effort intolerance or having angina in those patients there may be an underlying ischemic heart disease the patient might have been a diabetic not knowing any chest pain at all chronic diabetic also may have an undiagnosed ischemic heart disease and any patient who has got a known coronary artery disease whenever you are seeing pre op you should always see for what is the severity how is the patient clinically is the chest pain continuing is the uh, coronary artery disease stable or the patient has got an unstable angina whether it was a non st segment myocardial infarction or an st segment myocardial infarction what the therapy the patient is on whether the usually the cardiac optimization is in the form of beta blockers ac inhibitors and arbs and following a myocardial infarction it is either monotherapy with the adenosine uh, the p2 y12 inhibitors or aspirin or it is with the dual antiplatelet agents may it be aticagrelal pesuvral clopidogrel uh, all that with along with aspirin and what were the investigations done to know that the patient has got a cad whether coronary angiography was done what was the coronary angiography finding whether it is a single vessel double vessel triple vessel where is the lesion suppose if one lesion is addressed with the primary coronary intervention how are the other two lesions and suppose was the patient advised any cabg how is the left main all that you have to look when you are going for assessment of a coronary artery disease and when you are assessing always try to find out the risk reduction strategies for continuing the drugs angiolysis appropriate fluid management to see if the patient is having anemia all that will come under risk reduction strategies and whenever you are assessing those patients do you need any specific additional test was there any ecg done before 
does the patient have any decrease or uh, patient have worsening of symptoms than before so do we need an echocardiography do we need an ecg do you need a cardiac risk optimization all that you have to think before you are giving a uh, like consent to do a further case and whenever you are you are you are seeing a patient who has got a myocardial infarction suppose the patient does not have under how I mean the patient did not undergo any primary coronary intervention in the form of ptca to lad or no coronary intervention was done only coronary angiography was done or coronary angiography was not done at all but the patient sustained a myocardial infarction and is to be posted for a elective non cardiac surgery it is prudent to wait for at least 6 months following a myocardial infarction suppose if it's a time sensitive surgery or if you are thinking to uh, mitigate the risk and do you can defer an elective non cardiac surgery up to 3 months provided that there is no percutaneous coronary intervention so coming on to risk assessment of these patients risk assessment scales are n in number and one must know about goldman cardiac risk index least uh, revised cardiac risk index acs nsqip risk index and newly formed risk index is an american university of beirut risk index and these indexes are actually added in aca aha guidelines esc guidelines and canadian society guidelines so um, actually the canadian society guidelines will have least revised cardiac index and they do not believe much in acs nsqip and coming on to goldman cardiac risk index is is a 9 point scale wherein mi less than 6 months is given 10 points age more than 70 is given 5 points s3 gallop or jugular vein is depression is given 11 points which signifies a acute uh, heart failure and significant aortic stenosis carries 3 points rhythm other than sinus with the premature complexes on ecg has 7 points and more than 5 vpcs per minute is carrying 7 points poor general condition where the patient might have got a debilitation nutritional deficiency or poor like cold associated with cva bedridden patients all those patients are given 3 points and any intrathoracic any intraperitoneal or aortic surgery is given 3 points and emergency surgery is given 4 points the total point is around 53 it was a retrospectively developed index in 1977 involving 1001 non cardiac surgery patients and it is categorized as class 1 is 0 to 5 which carries 1% risk of maze and class 2 is 6 to 12% risk of uh, 12 points which carries 7% risk of maze and 13 to 25 points carry 14% risk of maze and more than 26 points carry 78% risk of major adverse cardiac events then came the time tested uh, least revised cardiac index or revised cardiac risk index which is rcri which is used day in and day out i use it routinely to assess any patient posted for any surgery so it's a 6 point scale where if each point is given uh, one point each and the first point is high risk surgery which will include intrathoracic intraperitoneal or supraguinal vascular surgery is assigned one point any prior history of ischemic heart disease diagnosed by any means may it be ecg or may it be by troponin elevation or may it be echocardiographic finding of regional wall abnormality or may it be a coronary angiogram showing a complete occlusion all that which signifies an ischemic heart disease is given one point any history of congestive cardiac failure where the patient is going to tell you that he's got an effort intolerance pulmonary rails orthopnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea chest x ray showing infiltrates and you have bilateral basal crepts when you hear an s3 gallop all that has given one point any prior history of cerebral vascular disease is given one point any diabetic patients pre operatively requiring insulin is given one point and creatinine more than 2 mg per deciliter is given one point and each is assigned one point it is a six point scale it is a moderate risk determination scale it is extensively validated externally using so many studies and it is accepted in both aha and canadian society guidelines and 0 point carries 0.4% risk of maze one carry 1% risk of maze two carries 2.4% risk of maze and more than three carries 5.4% risk of maze suppose if you put this rcri in a md calculator which is available in google suppose if they have two point it will be showing a 6.6% risk of maze if it's more than three then it will give us 
nine percent risk of maize. So it is actually whenever you have this, do it in an MD calculator which is available online. No, you will have increased risk. They would have given data that they have newly updated and they have given the increased risk data. And how do they uh, in RCRI? They would have actually seen postoperative troponin to address the postoperative major adverse cardiac events. So it actually appropriately measures the major adverse cardiac risk. But ACS NSQIP surgical index, they did not do any systemic monitoring of troponin postoperatively to say that the mortality was due to cardiac mortality. So this, whenever you are using this ACS Q, uh, NSQIP index or MICA index, it actually underestimates the risk. Only when you see troponin and address the cause of mortality is because of cardiac issue, will then it actually appropriately estimate the risk. But this ACS NSQ IP have not taken in, into consideration, the troponin they have not taken into consideration. And hence, using this index will always underestimate your uh, cardiac morbidity and mortality. And it's a 20 point scale where zero to 100 percent, zero is the lowest risk and 100 is the highest risk. And it is actually based on a very large set of data and it is also externally validated and is actually included in AHA guidelines of cardiac risk assessment and it is not included in Canadian risk assessment. So coming on to next subset of patients who are presenting to us is with the coronary intervention. As I have mentioned in my previous class, prior they were actually doing for any ischemic uh, occlusion of a cardiac vessel, prior they were actually doing a balloon angioplasty. So whenever they were, whenever you are going and inserting anything under an arterial tree, so you are doing a balloon angioplasty, say that you are doing a balloon angioplasty, consider this as a coronary, you are going, dilating a balloon and then coming back. So whenever this balloon is going and rubbing against an endothelium of a, a coronary artery, what happens is the endothelium reacts and there will be endothelial revascularization. So whenever this revascularization happened, only after a balloon angioplasty, what was happening is this revascularization was uncontrolled and it was proliferating densely and heavily. What would happen is, suppose if this was a vessel, if the neo-intimal proliferation of following a POBA is very high, whenever you're doing dilatation, the artery would have been like this. But after dilating, when the neo-intimal proliferation is not controlled, what would happen is the arterial lumen would have narrowed like this. So following a POBA, you had increased risk of, a, again, a coronary artery stenosis. It may not be always true, but it happens in some patients. So what they did was they introduced bare metal stenting. What they did was whenever they are doing a balloon angioplasty, following which they would actually give a bare metal stent. They thought this bare metal stent would check the neo-intimal proliferation and further risk of re-stenosis of coronary arteries will be very less. But what was happening is this neo-intimal proliferation, as you can see in this picture, this is a coronary artery. And this is a normal lumen of the artery. Whenever there is extimal, excessive neo-intimal proliferation, the arterial lumen is very much narrowed as in this picture. Suppose this actually happened even in bare metal stenting. As you can see, this is a stent. But the proliferation happened even in between the stent and the artery is really narrowed. Are you able to see the pointer now? Someone is telling the pointer is not visible. Okay. Visible now, sir? Yes, visible. Visible, madam. Uh, I'll just mark with the pen or highlighter. Okay. So, uh, just a second, madam. So, as you can see, this is a stent in place in a coronary. But this is a bare metal stent. This proliferation has happened even through the struts of the bare metal. And there is a neo-intimal proliferation which is happening excessively. And the coronary artery lumen is very much narrowed. So what they devised is they then gave this drug eluting stent. These drug eluting stents are nothing but antimitotic agents which have zetarolimus, pac paclitaxel or sivarolimus, which are antimitotic drugs like which were used for cancer, which will check the proliferation in place. That was used in drug eluting stents and that is used in drug eluting stents. What happens is this 
drug eluting stents eludes antimitotic drugs and it actually prevents the neointimal hyperplasia whereas the neointimal proliferation is very much organized and it actually leads to a more physiological arterial healing but what is the crux is for these drug eluting stents to mature to completely attain this more physiological healing it takes around 1 year and in this interim period of 1 year these drug eluting stents have high risk of restenosis if you stop them the dual antiplatelet agents it is imperative to continue the dual antiplatelet agents for a patient with drug eluting stents at least for 6 months and it is advisable to continue at least for 12 months following an acute coronary syndrome why because it takes at least 1 year for them to mature and the new intimal proliferation to have a more physiological arterial healing and these type of patients are presenting to us in increased numbers wherein within one year itself around 15% of the patients presents to us for a non cardiac surgery may it be elective emergency or urgent surgery and if you stop the antiplatelet agents they are going to have a risk of stent thrombus but if you continue this dual antiplatelet agents they are going to have a high risk of perioperative bleeding and how do you mitigate such risk is and you need to know the time interval for coronary intervention and a non cardiac surgery suppose if a balloon angioplasty alone was done you do any elective non cardiac surgery after 2 weeks after balloon angioplasty 1 month after a bare metal stenting and 1 year after a drug eluting stenting and it is that is important to look for the coronary angiogram report and, and get the history from the patient so in the interim period when you are planning for any non cardiac surgery you should always discuss with your cardiologist whether you should stop the antiplatelet agents or continue and you should express your concern about whether the surgery is high risk bleeding surgery or intermediate bleeding surgery suppose if the drug eluting stent is given and acs at index pci is if the stent was given for an acute coronary syndrome may it be a st segment elevation mi or non st segment elevation mi if it is yes or is there any other high risk ischemic features like suppose if the patient is having a decreased ejection fraction all those patients will have high risk of ischemic features like associated peripheral vascular disease then it is imperative to continue the dual antiplatelet agents at least for 12 months which is a class 1 indication suppose the pcs is done for a ptc is done for a stable cardiac disease then you can think of doing an elective non coronary non cardiac surgery after 6 months so in the interim period always continue the dual antiplatelet agents so how do you weigh the risk this is bleeding and stent thrombosis is you see how the risk of thrombus of the stent is or a percutaneous coronary intervention is versus you see how the risk of bleeding for the non cardiac surgery is and this is one important slide which you always have in mind the high risk thrombotic risk of pci is anywhere you are going to touch the patient less than 2 weeks following a balloon angioplasty or less than 1 month following a bare metal stent or less than 6 months following a pci which was not complex or less than 12 months following a complex pci complex pci is are the one which is being given at the bifurcation of any vessel whenever you are giving a long long segment stent or whenever you are giving two to three stents at the same uh, vessel or same artery whenever you are giving lmca to lad that cover of that kind of complete covering stents are called as complex stents and these stents if you are taking the patient within less than 12 months then that is a high thrombotic risk pci patient and hemorrhagic risk of non cardiac surgery is you always remember the high risk when you like put all the low risk in the in whichever surgery where you are seeing where you can actually cauterize or with with the superficial surgery will always fall under low risk of bleeding like hernioplasty incisional hernioplasty lap coli provided that they clip the uh, cystic artery better appendicectomy any arthroscopy or cystoscopy uh, mostly if they are doing arthroscopy under a tonic or an urethroscopy and one must note that carotid endarterectomy is itself a low risk procedure and uh, endarterectomy of lower limb evar tvar and Uh, are also considered as low risk bleeding surgeries and intermediate bleeding surgery is splenectomy hemorrhoidectomy gastrectomy knee and foot surgeries major spine surgeries prostates fall under intermediate risk and one under high risk is doing a whipple's hepatic resection proximal femur surgery 
TURP, TURBT, bladder, bladder tumor resection, prostatectomy, nephrectomy will all under, come under high risk. And in case of cardiac surgery, open CABG is considered only a intermediate risk bleeding surgery. Suppose if you do CABG for a percutaneous coronary intervention failure, then that is a high risk bleeding surgery. And in case of vascular surgery, open thoracic and thoracoabdominal surgeries are considered high risk. So now we are clear and any thrombotic risk for a PCA will be low if it's four weeks after a POBA, six months after a balloon met, uh, bare metal stenting and 12 months after a drug eluting stenting. Now we are clear about whether the thrombotic risk is low, intermediate or high. You are also clear about whether the hemorrhagic risk above is low, intermediate or high. So now what you must do is put this in your mind and form a tabular column. Say that the hemorrhagic risk of the surgery is low and thrombotic risk of the surgery is low. Whatever may be the hemorrhagic risk, if the thrombotic risk of the PCA is low, then you need not worry about stopping clopidogrel or presugrel or ticagrel. In the interim period, you can continue aspirin, discontinue P2Y12 inhibitors, resume them 24 hours to 72 hours postoperatively if there is no major hemorrhage or bleeding or increased from the drain, increased blood from the drains. You can resume them with the loading dose. Are we clear with this? If the thrombotic risk is low, you need not have anything in your mind. You just have to continue aspirin, discontinue clopidogrel five days prior, uh, presugrel seven days prior, like that, and like according to ASRA guidelines, and then resume with them in the post-op. Suppose if the thrombotic risk is intermediate, whatever may be the hemorrhagic risk, if it's a deferable surgery, try to defer. If it's non-deferable, again, continue aspirin, discontinue P2 white volume inhibitors, and resume within 24 to 72 hours with the loading dose. Suppose you see a patient who's got a high thrombotic risk, like this, less than two weeks following a POBA and all that. So thrombotic risk is very, very high. Suppose the hemorrhagic risk itself is very low. Say the patient is undergoing only a superficial surgery like lipoma excision, where it is easily cauterizable also. Then if it is elective surgery, you can try to postpone. Suppose if it's an infected one, you need to do it. Then you can actually continue with aspirin and clopidogrel because the hemorrhagic risk is very, very low. Suppose if the thrombotic risk is very, very high, but if it's an intermediate or high risk bleeding surgery, if it's a deferable surgery, you can defer. You can continue aspirin, discontinue P2 white well inhibitors, which is clopidogrel, presugrel, ticagrelol, all that. And you can consider IV antiplatelet agent bridging for both intermediate and high risk surgery. So how do you bridge with IV antiplatelet agent is, just a second. So IV antiplatelet agents are, um, IV antiplatelet agents are, Tyrofibin, Eftifibatide, and Cangrelor. These are the three available agents which are used as an IV measure and IV antiplatelet agents. Their action are quite reversible and their action is almost immediate. The offset time, like after stopping Tyrofibin, the platelet action will resume within four to six hours. The same for Eftifibatide and with Cangrelor, it will resume within one hour itself. So you always give them as an infusion. How do you give terofibin and ftfibatide is if it's presugrel you stop seven days prior if it's clopidogrel you stop five days prior three days prior to surgery if it's a high hemorrhagic risk and high thrombotic risk surgery three days prior to surgery you would start terofibin infusion suppose if the surgery is scheduled at 12 noon you stop terofibin infusion or ftfibatide infusion at 6 a.m in the morning you do the surgery at 12 Say the surgery is ending at 6 p.m. in the evening and you resume terofibin or ftfibatide at 12 at night provided that there is no increased drains, no risk of bleeding from the high-risk bleeding surgery. And in the post-operative period, after 24 hours to 48 hours, load them with clopidogrel if they were on clopidogrel or presugrel if they were on and follow by the OD dose. You stop four to six hours prior because the offset time is four to six hours. Suppose if it was cangrelor, the same, the stop, the duration of stopping the drug is same for both cangrelor and all IV antiplatelet agents. But to stop cangrelor, you can try stopping before one to six hours 
prior to a hemorrhagic surgery. And you can again resume it after four to six hours following a high, high hemorrhagic risk bleeding surgery. But are we very sure that IV antiplatelet agent bridging is associated with better outcomes? No. There are no larger data of studies which says if you bridge a patient with high thrombotic uh, risk versus a high hemorrhagic risk, if you bridge with IV antiplatelet agent bridging, I have personally seen terofibin, but have not personally come across any epifibatide or cangrelol. When I asked my cardiologist, he said, like, it was way back when I asked, he said, cangrelol is not available in India for this kind of use. So there is no large set of data which said that if you use terofibin, it is associated with increased perioperative outcomes. No, that was even not sure. But whenever you are asked in an exam or whenever you are given an option of very high thrombotic risk, then you can think of discussing your cardiologist and deciding upon continuing the rofobin or epifibatide for that sake. Okay. So as of now, I have finished one sub two subset, one with an ischemic heart disease and another with a ischemic uh, hypertension. So next sub is, uh, subset is a patient who will present to us with a heart failure. Previously, They were actually classifying heart failure as compensated heart failure, decompensated heart failure, systolic failure, diastolic failure like that. Now, it is like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Whenever they have like ejection fraction less than 40 percentage, it is heart failure with reduced, reduced ejection fraction where the systolic function of the heart is affected. The heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it is actually having a lower adjusted mortality rate when compared to reduced ejection fraction. It is actually a diastolic dysfunction of the heart which leads to failure. This heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, mostly they are on diuretics and if at all they present with and um, if they are hypertensives, mostly they will be on antihypertensives. It is mostly a supportive measure in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction like diuretics antihypertensives if they are throwing up some arrhythmias they would be put on resynchronization therapy like that but heart failure with reduced ejection fraction they are usually on beta blockers ac inhibitors or arbs or um, angiotensin receptor nephrolysin uh, receptor inhibitors like sacubitril valsartan and all that for cardiac remodeling and they will be also on antiplatelet agents suppose if the patient and how do you see and the cause of heart failure can be very many like it can be because of a Idiopathic, idiopathic heart failure or it can be because of a ischemic heart disease or it can be because of a valvular heart disease or it can be because of any secondary pathology like restrictive pathology leading on to heart failure. So heart failure causes can be very many. Suppose if the patient is presenting to us, how do you diagnose them if they have a heart failure? You ask for the symptom of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, check for pulmonary rails. And in uh, examination, look for if the JVP is elevated, uh, if, the pa if the patient is having bilateral crepes, if they are having any congestive hepatopathy, palpate the abdomen and look for right, right upper quadrant uh, pain, see if they are having bilateral fetal edema, all that can point you towards a heart failure patient. And if, they are, if you have newly diagnosed a heart failure, it is always prudent to delay any intermediate and high risk non cardiac surgery for at least three months following a newly diagnosed heart failure. And if you are to delay any elective procedure for optimization, you can try delaying up to one month, provided the patient is known cardiac heart failure patient. Suppose if the patient is having a heart failure, if it's an urgent procedure, try if you can hold up and optimize up to 24 hours like give diuretics if they are volume overloaded and you see if you can optimize with giving a goal directed guideline therapy like giving a central line and an arterial line for an intermediate or high risk non cardiac surgery so in the perioperative approach you always look for whether they are compensated or uncompensated as i told decompensation will be paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea dyspnea on exertion at rest tachypneic dyspneic uh, having pulmonary rails, elevated JVP, fetal edema, and their refer tolerance will be, I can only walk to restroom and come back. Some will be, I cannot even walk to restroom. I am that dyspneic. So all these will point towards uncompensated failure. Then your obvious thinking should be, see, it's an uncompensated failure. Do I need to do the surgery now? Is the surgery urgent or emergent? If it's elective, it should wait. You should discuss with your cardiologist to say it should wait. 
suppose a heart failure patient coming to you with a diabetic foot it's an impending sepsis in a failure then you may not think you should actually optimize you should take up the case whether under block or whether under ga it's up to you if there is no contraindication for regional anesthesia you can give regional anesthesia to the lower limb alone and do the case so it is individual case to case basis and it also depends upon whether the surgery is urgent emergent or elective so in an investigation in examination i've covered already in investigations you look for any history which will point you towards taking up the case in an emergency basis like sepsis impending sepsis impending uh, organ failure like that and so if a patient with heart failure presents to you with a urosepsis they've got a bilateral uh, hydroeurythronephrosis and that again is actually worsening their cardiorenal syndrome then obviously you must take the case under a high risk so that all you should look in the investigations and nt pro bnp values are ones which will give you an excellent clue about whether the patient is optimized or not if it is increased more than 2000 then you can say that they are not optimized properly and in the perioperative period if echo was not then 3 months prior and if the patient is showing you new symptom of worsening heart failure then you need to do echo at the admission and try to rule out any treatable cause for heart failure which were there and the drugs which the patient will be on as i told for compound uh, for preserved ejection fraction it's different set and for reduced ejection fraction it's different set and these subset of patients if it's reduced ejection ejection fraction will also be on anticoagulation and some patients with preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction if they are having any malignant ventricular arrhythmias they will be also on implantable cardiac defibrillators next is the valvular heart disease valvular heart disease whether it can be a right sided heart disease or left sided heart disease left sided it can be both stenosis and regurgitation lesion and right right side also it can be both stenosis and regurgitant lesions <clears throat> so it can be aortic stenosis aortic regurgitation mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation pulmonary stenosis pulmonary regurgitation tricuspid stenosis tricuspid regurgitation so whenever on a on a gross note whenever assessing any valvular heart disease patient you first of all see that the patient has got any symptoms or not if the patient is totally asymptomatic and their effort tolerance is good then the patient is really good whatever may the echo finding be if the patient's effort tolerance is good then the patient is going to do better suppose if the patient is dyspneic at rest the patient is having a failure a failure because of valvular heart disease then that should prompt us towards optimization so what is the severity of valvular pathology whether it is mild moderate severe stenosis or regurgitation so what is the risk of non cardiac intervention is it a high risk surgery is it intermediate risk surgery that should come to your mind and suppose if it's a right sided lesion or left sided lesion how is the right ventricle and left ventricle coping up for the volume overload or pressure overload whichever the a lesion may give if it's a stenosis it's a pressure overload if it's a regurgitation it's a volume overload so how is right ventricle reacting to it how is left ventricle reacting to it how are the pulmonary pressures is the pulmonary pressure high is the rv not popping up all that you have to look when you are looking for a valvular heart disease patient so to simply put any patient who, who is having who is undergoing a elective non cardiac surgery following an aortic stenosis they are critical patients moderate to severe aortic stenosis they are undoubtedly critical patients whether in whenever they are involving intermediate or high risk surgery suppose you are getting a case of aortic stenosis so the patient is it will depend upon whether to proceed with cardiac surgery first or non cardiac surgery first will depend upon whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic whether the non cardiac surgery is urgent or emergent so if the patient who has a severe valvular heart disease is always a critical patient provided the patient is symptomatic patients then the critical uh, uh, the risk of perioperative maze is going to be increased you always weigh the risk versus benefit of continuing with the risk of non cardiac surgery so any patient who has got a mean gradient of more than 50 and an aortic valve area of less than 1 is this patient whom i am talking about so moderate as and mild as you can always proceed with uh, elective Uh, non cardiac surgeries under increased risk suppose a patient who's got a severe aortic stenosis these three points are for patients who are not symptomatic so if it's an urgent surgery 
the patient has got a severe atrial stenosis but the patient is not having any symptoms then you can proceed with increased hemodynamic monitoring and explaining the increased perioperative risk of major adverse cardiac events suppose if the surgery it's a very high risk non cardiac surgery say you have to do a whipples but the patient has got a severe aortic stenosis say you want to do a hepatic resection for a uh, hcc then you can actually think of doing a balloon valvuloplasty because the patient in the perioperative period may not have a forward flow at all because of severe aortic stenosis the next is a low to moderate risk surgery can be performed with increased risk suppose these patients were asymptomatic suppose the patient is severely symptomatic having chest pain breast angina having effort intolerance having frequent episodes of syncope so these patients are severely symptomatic patients then you you frankly have to discuss with the cardiologist and the attenders discuss about whether trans aortic uh, aort trans arterial aortic valve replacement implantation can be done suppose there are conditions in which the tavi risk itself will be very high like atherosclerotic calcified valves and all that there are criteria for tavi which is going to be difficult in that case if the tavi risk itself is very high then it's prudent to go for a non cardiac surgery even in a severely symptomatic patients said and done any patient with severe aortic stenosis if they sustain a perioperative cardiac arrest it is going to be very difficult for do, for you to do a cpr and bring them back So you always explain the risk of perioperative maze based on RCRI or based on ACS and SQIP, and then decide for continuing with the non-cardiac surgery or not. So next is the uh, valvular MS. So in case of valvular MS, what is severe is any main gradient across the valve more than ten, and pulmonary artery pressure is more than fifty, and the valve area is less than one is considered as a severe MS. so when do you proceed for a non cardiac surgery in case of severe ms is just a second so when do you proceed is whenever the valve area is more than 1.5 because it's a mild stenosis and whenever the pulmonary artery pressures are less than 50 you can proceed to non cardiac surgery suppose if when whenever you are seeing a mild stenosis patient they are symptomatic with severe ms where the valve area is less than 1 or the pulmonary artery pressures are more than 50 then you consider doing a percutaneous mitral valve commissurotomy before doing a non non coronary surgery or it can be a balloon mitral valvuloplasty provided that the valve is actually coping for balloon mitral valvuloplasty so any mild mitral stenosis pa pa pressure is less than 50 you can proceed with the ncs um and for other non cardiac surgeries where the patient is severely symptomatic with severe ms and the pulmonary pressures are high you are actually think about doing a percutaneous commissurotomy or balloon mitral valvuloplasty before doing a elective non cardiac surgery so for any regurgitant lesions as a gender pardon me can somebody mute yourself i am actually able to hear some background noise yes, then, so sorry. okay so for risk stratification of primary regurgitant lesions regurgitant lesions are generally very well tolerated unless they are going to have a ejection fraction failure or systolic failure of left ventricle or right ventricle uh, unless they develop that kind of failure they will usually tolerate very well severe mr with left ventricular ejection fraction decreased patients are one subset whom you are notoriously going to get a increased risk of perioperative maze so whenever they having a non significant lesion like moderate mr moderate ar or they are having an asymptomatic severe mr or severe ar but the ejection fraction is preserved any patient who is having a primary regurgitant lesion the ejection fraction will be actually quite higher than the usual because they are going to even pump the regurgitant volume as well so provided that the ejection fraction is well maintained they are not going to have any additional risk suppose if the patient is having ar mr severe ejection systolic dysfunction ejection uh, pulmonary artery pressure is more than 50 then those subset of patients you need to discuss with cardiologist about doing a if the criteria for aortic valve replacement or vital valve replacement is met before meeting up with the non cardiac surgery then you should proceed only with valve replacement and non with non cardiac surgery so that has to be kept in mind so any echocardiogram re report when you are seeing see the patient is symptomatic see if it's severe ar see if it's a high risk non cardiac surgery then you discuss with the cardiologist that this patient is going to have an increased risk of perioperative maze 
So you discuss with the patient and the attendants to undergo whether AVR first or MVR first or non-cardiac surgery first. So next subset of patients are those who were on prosthetic valves. So if the patient is on prosthetic valve, you look for the prior echo report to see if the prosthetic valves were put for mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis, aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis or any tricuspid valve repair was done. So whenever you are looking at an echo report, you obviously see for what is the type of a valve, whether it is mechanical valve or bioprosthetic valve, and what is the current status of the valve? What is the gradient across the valve? Is the gradient okay? Or is the bioprosthetic bio valve itself is stenosed? Or is there any vegetations across bioprosthetic valve? Is the bioprosthetic valve function okay? Or if it's a mechanical valve, how are the valve leaflets? A, any vegetation on the valve leaflets? How is the closure and opening? How is the systolic function of right and left ventricle following the implantation of bioprosthetic valve? Is there any bioprosthetic valve leak? All the should, you should see in the echocardiograph report. And obviously, any patients who is on mechanical valve will obviously be on anticoagulation. So look for, depending upon mitral valve and aortic valve, there is a guideline the targeted INR which should be maintained and that has to be taken into consideration and CBC has to be done because any uh, turbulent flow across the prosthetic valve will actually lead to hemolysis and the patient may have anemia and hemolysis. This is true for any patient who has got aortic stenosis also. The sheer stress across blood moving across the aortic valves, they will actually create a, a consumed von Willebrand factor and they will have von Willebrand, acquired von Willebrand disease. Any patient who is elderly, severe aortic stenosis, 50 to 70 percent of them will actually have acquired von Willebrand disease because of turbulent flow across the um, aortic stenosis. So in echocardiograph report, I told what all we must see and the risk of prosthetic valve thrombus especially in case of a mechanical valve. It is very high in mitral valve when compared to aortic valve. And the risk of prosthetic valve thrombus is actually very, very high in the initial two to three months. And the risk itself lessens it after six months. And as I told, there are guidelines for targeted INR for mechanical valve and bioprosthetic valve. These mechanical valve patients, they will never be on dabigator or river, river oxybin or apixaban they will mostly invariably be on only vitamin K anticoagulation. And for mechanical MVR with no additional risk factors of thrombotic etiology, the therapeutic INR goal is 2.5. Suppose whenever they were doing an angio, there was a coexistent coronary artery disease, then they would actually start the patient on aspirin also. So if this patient is presenting to you for a non-cardiac surgery, Mechanical AVR with no risk factors, the targeted INR is 2.5. They are on warfarin. If, if these patients were to undergo an elective non-cardiac surgery, stop warfarin five days prior. Bridge them with, uh, you need not bridge them with anything. In these patients, if you bridge, that is associated with increased risk of hemorrhage rather than decreased risk of prosthetic valve thrombus. So for this patient, no need for any bridging for mechanical AVR. In case of mechanical AVR with other risk factors, other risk factors are patient in AF. Obviously, they are going to be thrombotic. LA thrombosis is going to come when the patient is having AF. And any patient who has got a prior thromboembolism, any patient who is having a hypercoagulable state, say hyperhomocysteinemia, the patient already have a pulmonary thrombus, they, the, I mean, uh, deep in thrombosis, that case, and or prior thromboembolism and left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This again, the patient may have an epical clot when they are going to have a left ventricular systolic dysfunction. In that case, additional risk factors, the therapeutic goal is three. If these subset of patients present to you for a non-cardiac surgery, stop warfarin five days prior, bridge them with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Unfractionated heparin means stop six hours prior to surgery. Low molecular weight heparin prophylactic dose means stop 12 hours prior to surgery. As per ASRA guidelines, if you're going to pose the patient, then do the non-cardiac surgery. If the patient is mitral valve, mechanical mitral valve patient, may it be additional risk factors, even without additional risk factors, since because the risk of prosthetic valve thrombus is very high in mitral valve, the therapeutic INR goal is three. 
so if they will be on aspirin if at all they are uh, there are any concomitant other cardiac issues so for these mechanical avr with risk factors and mechanical mitral valve you need to bridge with therapeutic anticoagulation and then do the surgery these anticoagulation bridging will be associated with increased risk of bleeding and since it's a mechanical valve you uh, you'll always try to bridge if it's a mitral valve per se suppose if it's a prosthetic valve may it be mdr or avr for avr you are going to do a initial 3 to 6 months for you will give vitamin k anticoagulation after that since because it's a bioprosthetic valve you will give aspirin suppose if the patient has undergone an aortic valve implantation whenever there is low risk of bleeding then they would actually start on aspirin and clopidogrel suppose if the patient has other indication for putting on vitamin k anticoagulation they will be on vitamin k anticoagulation and therapeutic inr goal is somewhere around 2.5 for tavi so next subset of patients who have got prior thromboembolic history with the cardiac etiology they will be on newer oral anticoagulant agents such as factor 2 inhibitors or factor 10 inhibitors which may be uh, 10 inhibitors can be apixaben rivaroxaban or edoxaban and uh, direct thrombal inhibitors like dabi like that and uh, that will depend upon when whenever you are doing a case with patient with newer anticoagulation agents there is no need for routine bridging which is recommended suppose if you think that the patient has got a very high thrombus based on chardvac score then you can give them lmwh post op like low molecular weight post op if you are going to do any neurosurgical procedure for any patients who are on either oral anticoagulants or warfarin like either either newer anticoagulants or vitamin k antagonist or heparin or low molecular weight heparin if you were to attempt any neuroaxial procedure you should follow astra guidelines so for if you are not attempting a neuroaxial procedure then if the bleeding surgery is bleeding is very minimal then if it's dabigatron or apixaben provided that the egfr is okay then you may skip only the evening dose of dabi it's usually given as 110 bd so you may skip the evening dose of dabi and if it's rivaroxaban or adaxaban you can continue since because it's a low risk bleeding surgery you can restart within after 6 hours following a minor bleeding surgery for newer oral anticoagulant agents suppose it's a low risk bleeding you can actually consider stopping one day prior to surgery and consider restarting the uh, noac 12 hours after a non cardiac surgery suppose if it's a high risk bleeding surgery you stop 48 hours prior you need not have any noac started in the peri op immediate post op you can give prophylactic low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin you can consider restarting them only after 42 to 70 uh, 48 to 72 hours following elective non cardiac surgery clear this guideline is only for those patients who have a normal gfr suppose the patient has got an increased gfr then the duration of stopping dabigatron because it is directly associated with egfr you have to stop at least 72 hours prior and the time will proportionately increase if the gfr is going to proportionately decrease just a second so next is a subset of patient who has got rhythm abnormalities so rhythm abnormalities can be very many as i mentioned here so one notorious rhythm which we will see in elderly patients with mitral stenosis or valvular heart disease patient is elderly patient is atrial fibrillation this atrial fibrillation can be uh, paroxysmal wherein it is lasting only for 7 days persisting with which is lasting for more than 7 days long persisting it can be lasting for more than uh, i mean at least more than at least for 12 months and permanent if the patient has got af for more than a year so why are we bothered about af is the atrial kick is lost and the preload is grossly dependent upon like only if the ventricular rate is controlled will then the heart will have enough time to have a <clears throat> lv will have enough time to have the preload and hence any af with fast ventricular rate rate more than 100 or rate more than 130 is not going to be well tolerated in the perioperative period suppose you say that preoperatively you have seen an acute af patient who is hemodynamically compromised impending hemodynamic compromise then you stop reassess whether you need to do the surgery 
suppose if the patient has got a persistent AS, like for past 12 uh, months, the patient is having AS. The, in that patient, you are not trying to achieve any rhythm control. Whatever we are trying to achieve is the rate control. So whenever you are trying for rate control, the patient will be on amiodarone, digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers like varapamil and dimsum. Suppose if the patient has gotten AF, then the patient may also be on anticoagulation because they may have a left atrial thrombus. The propensity of blood to get stagnant in the LA is increased because the left atrial kick is decreased. So the blood will get stagnant and obviously they will form a thrombus and that thrombus will perox paroxysmally embolize to form a cardiac emboli. Uh, so in those patients, they will be on anticoagulation. Suppose if you are seeing a patient with acute AF, then you can achieve a rhythm control by giving an amide around 150 milligram bolus. If they are hemodynamically compromised, you can try cardiovating them with a 150 joules. And you can try controlling with amiodarone as well. So your perioperative goal of rate control versus rhythm control depends upon what is the scenario of AF the patient is presenting, whether it is acute or chronic. Chronic means rate control, acute rhythm control. You can also aim for rate control in acute also because rate control or rhythm control, the outcome is not going to differ much in case of AF with fast ventricular rate. So the next subset of patients are symptomatic bradycardia patients and high degree AV block. Symptomatic bradycardia patients is the patient will have the scene as uh, like uh, syncope and all that when they are having symptomatic bradycardia. Any, any, any heart rate less than 60 is bradycardia in normal individuals, less than 50 in patients with beta blockers and any heart rate less than 40, even a normal adult human is not going to tolerate a heart rate of less than 40. So on high degree AV block, this AV block can be first degree AV block, wherein there is a fixed prolongation of PR interval of more than 0.2 milliseconds. In second degree AV block, there are two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 Menke back block is there is a fixed prolongation of PR interval. There is a progressive prolongation of PR interval followed by a dropped beat. So this is type 1, sorry, uh, type 1 second degree AV block. These AV blocks usually will respond to uh, atropinization and it is easily treatable. Whereas type 2 second degree AV block wherein the PR interval will be fixed. Following a fixed PR interval, there will be an occasional dropped beat. So this second degree type 2 AV block may not be responsive to atropine and it may be hemodynamically concerning also. It is very less tolerated in patients who are having a second degree type 2 AV block and patients with complete heart block where there is a complete dissociation of atria and the ventricles, the atria contract at the own rate and the ventricle contract at their own rate. Hence, this is also not well tolerated in any patients perioperatively. So in case of any uh, valvular uh, on any um, complete heart block or degree AV block, you always check for any electrical abnormality, any high vagal tone that the patient might have got. You always look for any <clears throat> myocardial infarction that the patient might have presented it with. So complete heart block can be a feature of uh, LC occlusion or an RCA occlusion and second degree AV block also can be a feature of RCA occlusion. So you always have to have a support. first time the patient, in, patient is presenting to you with second degree type 2 AV block. You need to have all these possibilities in your mind, whether it is MI, whether it is electrolyte disturbances, will the patient tide over. Suppose if you want to directly tide over this patient in the perioperative period or the patient developed type 2 second degree AV block in the perioperative period, then you should always consider transcutaneous spacing. And if transcutaneous spacing is possible preoperatively, then you have to do a transvenous spacing. Suppose if the patient is, <clears throat> can wait for a non-cardiac surgery for symptomatic type 2 second degree AV block and complete heart block, you need a permanent pacemaker in place before you touch them for an elective non-cardiac surgery. Then is the bundle branch block. These bundle branch block can be because of age related. Right bundle branch block can be because of pulmonary artery hypertension, car pulmonale, any vascular uh, etiology or myocardial infarction or electrolyte abnormalities. The same for left bundle branch block. It can be because of age, hypertension, ischemic heart disease. 
so new onset bundle branch block you should always have think the possibility of uh, myocardial ischemia in the background so does patient with bundle branch block have a increased risk of maze new onset bundle branch block patients have a increased risk of maze anybody who has got a prior bundle branch block and is presenting to you for an elective non cardiac surgery they may actually tide over with not much increased risk and next subset of patient is supraventricular tachycardia may it be av nodal reentrant tachycardia or av nodal tachycardia and one subset of patients is wolf parkinson's and white syndrome there is there is an accessory bundle of kent which will supply which is an accessory pathway from the uh, a, which will bypass the av node so in the perioperative period whenever you are trying to whenever this patient becomes compromised if it's hemodynamically compromising you can try cardioversion if it's concerning then you can give procainamide or ibutilide any drug which will slow the conduction across av node like beta blockers or contraindicated in wolf parkinsonism white syndrome so you should always have a high degree of suspicion in supraventricular tachycardia if the patient with supraventricular tachycardia or previously on beta blockers that should be continued in the perioperative period and you should not hesitate twice to uh, if it's a plain supraventricular tachycardia and if the patient is uh, hemodynamically stable then you can try adenosine then like strike carotid massage try adenosine and if it's not working try for other measures like uh, calcium channel blockers like dilsum in the perioperative period and when there is a ventricular arrhythmias when there is premature complexes or potentially lethal arrhythmias which can be ventricular premature complex which is more than 30 per minute or whenever there is non sustained vt and whenever there is a lethal arrhythmia which can be ventricular tachycardia these arrhythmias can be potentiated because of electrolyte abnormalities itself like hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia so whenever you are assessing you always look for these potential precipitating factors it can also be because of a structural disease or because of a myocardial infarction so it is always imperative to rule out all these in the preoperative assessment stage itself suppose if it's a benign vpcs alone you need not worry much checking for electrolytes and replacing magnesium and potassium is going to be fine suppose if it's a potentially lethal arrhythmias where the vpc is more than 30 per minute or if it's a non sustained vt you have to think twice and evaluate if it's a myocardial infarction or not if it's a potentially lethal arrhythmia ventricular tachycardia which is stable you always have to think about to put the patient on implantable cardiac defibrillator or resynchronization therapy before you attempt for any elective non cardiac procedure so next are the subsets of patient who will have a cardiomyopathy this cardiomyopathy patients can be <clears throat> one with a dilated cardiomyopathy the dilated cardiomyopathy may be because of a uh, ischemia or maybe because of valvular heart disease or it can be because of a idiopathic reason itself these subsets of patient will have dilated ventricles and because of the dilation the annular mitral ring also is going to get dilated and they will have secondary mr and hence these subsets of patients are usually on anticoagulants beta blockers if they are actually going to tolerate or they will be on ac inhibitors or arbs provided that there is no cardiorenal syndrome and uh, anticoagulation as well because there is a stagnation of blood in the ventricles so those subsets of patient are going to have very high risk of perioperative maze because of their concomitant underlying lesion next is a patient with restricted cardiomyopathy whom we do not see much commonly those may be because of any restricted pathology within the right or left ventricle next notorious subset is the patient who are having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this deserves a special mention because these patients may not be hypertensive but they will have asymmetric septal hypertrophy and these subsets of patients can present to you with effort intolerance sudden onset of syncope sudden unconsciousness like that so they usually tolerate their disease well when but they decompensate when they develop a malignant ventricular arrhythmias whenever you look at a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy echo report you have to look for two things whether it is obstructive or non obstructive whether there is systolic anterior motion of mitral leaflet which is causing a mitral regurgitation or not 
suppose if there is if the disease is non obstructive and suppose if there is no systolic anterior motion of mitral leaflet which is causing a mitral regurgitation then this patient may not possess a increased risk suppose if the patient is giving a dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction your perioperative goal should be optimizing preload giving a negative inotrope continue beta blocker in the perioperative period if the patient was previously getting any malignant ventricular arrhythmias these patients will have icd in place and hence that has to be that is implantable cardiac defibrillator in place and that concerns has to be kept in mind so any adult patient who is having a congenital heart disease if they are presenting to you see what is the underlying pathology and what was the surgery done whether it is a corrective surgery or whether it is a palliative surgery whether asd was there asd closure was attempted and there is a residual disease or the patient had a tetralogy of pallo there was a bt shunt which was done and further palliation was not done like pulmonary valve optimization was not done so that you have to follow whether the patient has got a single ventricular physiology whether the patient has got a font and circulation or adult congenital cardiac disease there is total decompensation the left to right shunt asd which was there now got de decompensated and the patient now is having a right to left shunt and it become an ensenmenger all this uh has to be dealt in detail when you are looking at an echo report following an adult congenital cardiac disease so what is the underlying pathology whether it is palliation or whether it is uh, corrective surgery looking at the echo report you should be able to find what is the residual lesion if it what is the sequel you are looking for if it's a right to left left to right shunt how are the pa pressures how is right ventricular coping is the right ventricular pressures all right suppose in this patients if you were to deliberately lower the svr in the perioperative period then they may have a reversal of shunt when the right ventricle is not coping so any patient who's got a shunt lesions across any chamber it may be asd or vsd whenever you assess you always give iv cannula with iv um, iv filter with that air filter only because there is always risk of paradoxical air embolism whenever there is a residual lesion across the heart provided that the lesion was right to left shunt or left to right shunt which overloads right heart the patient will always have a restrictive lung disease because there is chronic pulmonary artery hypertension pruning of vessels so that may lead to restrictive lung disease itself and these patients are notoriously prone for arrhythmias dilated left atrium dilated right atrium the sa node gets stretched so they may be on increased risk of arrhythmias any patient who is undergoing a avcd repair or atrioventricular canal repair they might have sutured the sa node or av node itself then they may have a conductive block those patients will be on pacemakers so that also should be taken into consideration any patient who's got a cyanotic heart disease because of the innate nature they have actually increased bleeding risk for any non cardiac surgery even cardiac surgery itself and one notorious point you should notice any patient whom you are seeing with the font and circulation in font and circulation it is basically a single ventricular physiology there will be only one functioning ventricle whether it may be a right ventricular function or a left ventricular function mostly the ventricle which is there will be palliated as a left ventricle and the right ventricular circulation what will happen to right ventricular circulation is they would have actually made a connection from svc to pulmonary artery in the initial stage that is the bidirectional blunt shunt and at the later stage when the child becomes 5 to 6 years of age they will connect ivc to pulmonary artery so that is a total font and circulation there will be no effective right ventricle to push the blood from right ventricle into pulmonary artery it becomes more of a passive flow from head like gravity dependent flow but from the lower limb there should be negative intrathoracic pressure to suck the blood from the venous system from the inferior vena cava to pulmonary artery to aid in the preload so any patients with the font and circulation whenever you are assessing preoperatively their preload is dependent only on negative intrathoracic pressure because there is no right ventricle to pump the blood into the pulmonary artery the ibc is directly connected to pulmonary artery suppose if these patients were you were to give ga you always have to have decreased peep 
optimize the adequate tidal volume and never apply any increased intrathoracic pressures or valsalva maneuver in these patients because their volume, return volume or preload will become drastically less. Another one point is if these patients were to arrest whenever we are doing CPR, you also have to combine intermittent abdominal compressions to aid in the preload if the patient is having a fontan circulation. Only when you compress the abdomen, there will be preload in fontan patients if they are arresting. So that is one interesting point which you should note about fontan circulation. So as of now, I have covered what are all the diseases the patient would present to you with. Now I'm moving on to what are all the investigations you should do pertaining to this cardiovascular etiology. So whenever the patient is presenting to you for any non-cardiac surgery, all these must come into our mind. And from this, you should pick what all you must do for the particular patient. Any low risk or intermediate risk, whatever the risk may be, you should actually do a CBC to find out if the patient is having anemia or thrombocytopenia because anemia is associated with worse outcomes. Renal function test to look for if it is hypertension to look for end organ damage. If it is cardiac IHD to look for any cardiorenal syndrome. Any congestive hepatopathy, if you suspect, you can see liver function test. Any patient who is on AC inhibitors, ARBs, diuretics, uh, any patient who is septic, also you have to look for serum electrolytes. Any patient who has got any arrhythmias, may it be malignant, lethal or non-lethal, benign PVCs, all that, even for atrial fibrillation, you should look for serum electrolytes. Any patient who is giving you symptoms of ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, or undiagnosed ischemic heart disease, diabetic, long-term diabetic, in whom the symptoms may not be evident, but they are posting for a intermediate or high-risk non-cardiac surgery, then you definitely have to do an ECG. Suppose if there is ECG available just done prior to three months, the patient is not having any symptoms worsening or any uh, symptoms which suggest of worsening of cardiac illness, then you can continue with the same ECG. Echo also holds the same. If the patient gives you any history of worsening of echo tolerance, never suggest to ask for, ask for an echocardiography in the interim perioperative period. Suppose if the patient is giving you resting ECG and echo is normal, but the patient is consistently saying you that the echo tolerance is very less. I had one patient who is 69 year old. I mean, I assessed her just two days prior. She is 69 year old. The resting ECG and resting echo is normal but she is posted for extensive staging laparotomy following a carcinoma fallopian tube where the disease is very extensive and they are planning for a elective high-risk non-cardiac surgery. It's not an elective, it's a time-sensitive high-risk non-cardiac surgery. The cardiologist has just seen the ECG and echo, but he has not given any risk stratification. I spoke to the cardiologist again. See, it's a high-risk non-cardiac surgery. She is consistently giving symptoms of effort intolerance and dyspnea even while walking on a level ground for at least 200 meters. I told him to reassess the patient if it is possible to do a dobutamine stress echo or she was able to walk, she was able to do exercise. So if it's possible to do a TMT and find out if she has an inducible ischemia because that will alter the treatment course. If suppose inducible ischemia is there, then the patient can subsequently subjected for any coronary angiography has to be taken into consideration before you take up any patient for an elective high risk non time sensitive or elective high risk non cardiac surgery. So depending upon the symptoms of the patient only you should decide whether you should go for echo testing or an stress testing. So stress echo can be based on whether it can be based on dipyrimidamol or dobutamine. In case of patients who are having cerebral aneurysm or coronary or ischemic heart disease, like known ischemic heart disease, or patients <clears throat> who may not tolerate increased heart rate because of their age and so on, then you can go with dipyrimidamol stress echo. Suppose if the patient will not uh, tolerate dipyrimidamol, say the patient is bronchial asthmatic, then you can give a dobutamine stress echo, provided that the patient is going to undergo a intermediate or high-risk non-cardiac surgery. Any routine advocation for CT coronary angiography is not at all recommended. And routine coronary angiography and revascularization for any non-cardiac surgery for stable IHD is not recommended. Nowadays, there is increased stress upon biomarkers. The biomarkers are high sensitive troponin. Why are they advised is they have now seen that myocardial injury following non-cardiac surgery or 
uh, as you, one can say, uh, the patient will not have any symptoms of any symptoms of myocardial injury because most common symptom what they will present is chest pain. But you would have adequately treated any post-operative pain with analgesic, isn't it? May it be para, may it be fentanyl, may it be NSAIDs, or the patient still with diabetic, their pain would have been masked. And most of the patients, they would have tachycardia in the perioperative period, and that may be overlooked. And any patient, will, most of the patients, they do not have any symptoms at all, which may signify that they have a myocardial injury. In such patients or any patients who have got more than 45 years of age, who is undergoing a high-risk non-cardiac surgery, and any patients more than 65 years of age with the cardiovascular risk factors, what are the cardiovascular risk factors you are talking about? The patient with the peripheral arterial disease, ischemic heart disease, pulmonary artery hypertension, core pulmonary, cerebrovascular accident. So any patient more than 65 years, even with risk factors, or any patients with an established cardiovascular risk factors, even less than 45 years of age, what you are supposed to do is, if they are undergoing any intermediate or high-risk non-cardiac surgery, you have to do troponin prior to surgery, and repeat troponin first post-operative day and also second post-operative day. If there is increase in troponin on the second post-operative day, even without any echo changes or ECG changes, this is considered as myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. This is a uh, this may be a new entity because we might have always deal with perioperative myocardial infarction. No, myocardial injury following non-cardiac surgery is a separate entity wherein you need not have chest pain, you need not have ECG change, you need not have any change in the echo, just troponin elevation is fine. And this myocardial in injury following non-cardiac surgery is also associated with worser outcomes. Perioperatively, you need to optimize them by starting aspirin, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, if at all they are hemodynamic persist, I mean, uh, allows. And next is the drug which are you will continue perioperatively and which you will stop perioperatively and one notorious thing you will be asked if you are going to do any cardiac case in the long cases what is poi study that is perioperative ischemic evaluation studies wherein they have given two, 200 milligram metoprolol perioperatively on the day of surgery to patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery and they have assessed what is the risk of uh, perioperative maze Though patients who have taken 200 milligram of metoprolol preoperatively had lesser incidence of MACE, they had increased incidence of all-cause mortality, stroke, and hypotension. And hence, you, you need not stop start the patient on beta blocker just before to the day of surgery. If it was started several days prior, it is always prudent to continue beta blockers because if you withhold the beta blockers, then that is associated with worser outcomes. So, Preoperative initiation of beta blockers is not recommended. Preoperative initiation of alpha blockers and statins is not recommended. If the patient were on amiodarone and evabradin, evabradin is like any negative chronotropic agent which will not affect the inotropy. And any patient on AF or chronically on amiodarone for arrhythmia prevention should be continued in the preoperative period. Diuretics you need to assess on a patient to patient basis. Any patient with acute heart failure who will need a diuretic and is not septic, where you need to effectively remove the volume from the patient, in them you can try to continue. But you also need to have consideration in the mind about the electrolyte abnormalities like hyponatremia, hypokalemia, which will come, and also decreased preload, which the patient may get if you are going to um, uh, have a grossly increased negative balance. So you can stop on the day of surgery if the Day of me, if the surgery is going to involve large volume fluid shifts and do a guideline directed, go directed therapy. So, if the AC inhibitor is given for hypertension, it is always prudent to stop 24 hours prior to surgery. Restart it 24 hours after surgery because whenever you re, don't restart AC inhibitors, that is associated with worser outcomes. Suppose if you continue AC inhibitors, that is associated with increased risk of perioperative hypotension. And hence, it is not advised to continue AC inhibitors. You may always have increased, like whenever you stop AC inhibitors and you look in trap, you may feel like the hypertension is going way beyond control. But that can be mitigated either with labiclol boluses or um, NTG infusion rather than having a hypotension develop. Like that will have a worse outcome than a hypertension giving it. 
then calcium channel blockers to be continued perioperatively and anticoagulants as per ASRA guidelines or as per what I have discussed in the prior slides. And uh, SGLT inhibitors, this is newer agents which you must take into consideration because now it has become a class one indication for those patients who are giving a diastolic dysfunction or preserved ejection fraction. The patient will be on dapoxyphosolin or uh, like 10 milligrams or 5 milligrams. What happens is these group of agents are very notorious to cause uh, euglycemic DKA. Their mechanism of action is to increase the urine excretion of uh, glucose. So whenever you see urine protein in them, it is going to be 3 plus or 4 plus. So urine protein becomes invalid in patients who are on HGLT inhibitors. But they are more prone to develop euglycemic DKA. And hence, whenever these patients are on oxera, I mean, that is a trade name, dapagifrosolin, you should stop them at least uh, 48 hours prior to uh, elective intermediate or high risk surgery because of the risk of euglycemic DKA. So as I told before, the, the recommendation of strongly against starting beta blockers within 24 hours, starting aspirin, starting uh, alpha blockers uh, like prasosin are also and starting calcium channel blockers 24 hours prior to surgery or any coronary revascularization session attempting for stable cardiac disease also is not recommended at all. And one should always know whether to give infective endocarditis prophylaxis or not. Any prosthetic valve, including TAVI, you have to give an infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Any unprepared congenital cyanotic heart disease, repaired cyanotic heart disease with residual shunts, any patients with <clears throat> cardiac transplant with a regurgitation lesion, you should give an infective endocarditis prophylaxis. So now I'll be discussing about three case scenarios. I'll try to finish as early as possible. I'm sorry for dragging so long. And so first is a 58 year old male. He's a hypertensive and known ischemic heart disease patient who has met with an RTA and had a vascular injury of his lower limb, which is a femoral artery. And it threatens his lower limb if it's not intervened. So he had history of myocardial infarction two months back and is on medications like uh, aspirin, clopidogrel, beta blocker. And his effort tolerance is the same and his meds has been more, this, more than four months and it's the same, remained the same in the last two months. And there is no history of chest pain or failure symptoms. His echo taken two months back shows adequate LV and there was no regional wall motion abnormality. Now, this scenario, which is threatening his lower limb, is an emergency surgery which must be taken less than six, uh, six hours. So, his effort tolerance is good. Two months before taken, echo is good. Since it's an elective, I mean, emergency surgery, which should be taken less than six hours, you need not have a echo or for that sake, even ECG done. You can proceed with the surgery because it's an emergency surgery. So, the case scenario two is, he is a 79-year-old male patient who is a smoker. He is having IHT and the COPD as a comorbidity illness and is posted for elective inguinal hernia repair. He is giving history of exertional dyspnea and palpitations, which is worse than before. So no investigations of past year is available. And when you are seeing the patient clinically, he is having AF at fast ventricular rate and heart rate is somewhere around 130 per minute. And he is having borderline BP of 90 or 70. And echo is moderate left ventricular dysfunction and he is having a bilateral beast. So now you are having a hemodynamically significant arrhythmia. Now what you should do is you should postpone and evaluate because it's an elective case. You need not have a significant arrhythmia subject to an elective surgery in this scenario. Whenever there is significant arrhythmia, pause and treat. Okay. So now first, next case scenario is a 60-year-old female who is a diabetic on insulin. So that becomes RCRI 1. Okay. Score 1 posted for Whipple's procedure. This is an intraperitoneal surgery. That's a high-risk surgery. So that becomes score two. And she had history of TIA. So that becomes score three. And her effort tolerance is more than four. ECG echo is within normal limits. And effort tolerance is adequate. There is no other uh, RCRI points. So the RCRI is three. And it is a 5.4% risk of MACE. And in this patient, since because the effort tolerance is four, more than four, I have not undergone any further testing. Suppose if it were less than four, I would have asked the cardiologist to do a stress testing. Since because it's RCRI3 and the patient with known cardiovascular risk factors, 
you need to check antiprobian p levels and do a serial troponin levels pre op and post op so here are two guidelines which they will ask you whenever you are going for a theory examination or a practical examination on the left is an aha guideline and on right is the canadian guidelines i compare and contrast between the two so the first one is a first case scenario any mi patient should be taken for immediately less than 6 hours you need not do anything proceed with high degree of perioperative surveillance that is the same for both the guidelines okay and second is the second case scenario second case scenario was active uh, significant arrhythmia which was atrial fibrillation so any atrial fibrillation any severe valvular disease acute coronary syndrome decompensated heart failure if it's a planned surgery you postpone so the second surgery i said i'll postpone so i have postponed it the third is the third case scenario you use the least revised cardiac index i have used the least revised cardiac index the score was more than 4 okay in this case the risk is very high because it's a whipple surgery then i have moved to the fourth point to assess the functional capacity the patient itself said that the metabolic equivalence was more than 4 and hence i have not assessed this patient any further and i am subjecting this patient to the non cardiac surgery which is time sensitive suppose if the effort tolerance is less than 4 the patient is dyspneic at rest then i would discuss with the cardiologist to assess whether dobutamine stress echo will affect my treatment plan i um, mean plan of treatment suppose if dobutamine stress echo is done or stress ecg is done it is showing tmt positive or dobutamine stress echo is, do, is showing regional valve motion abnormality what would be the ideal choice for that patient who is undergoing a high risk cardiac surgery is you take up the patient for cag you do a balloon angioplasty after 2 weeks you take up the patient for the high risk non cardiac surgery and that is how you should plan with the cardiologist in the interim period continue aspirin and clopidogrel stop 5 days prior continue aspirin because it's a high mean after 2 weeks the thrombotic risk would have become low so you continue aspirin and then in the post operative period start clopidogrel after 24 hours with the loading dose that is how it goes suppose if i am saying that the coronary itself cannot be revascularized it's an lnca lesion it's a very high risk cabg or a pca then i should talk with the primary surgical unit to see if any palliation for the whipples can be done or any palliation for the tumor can be done or whether the surgery itself can wait like that so that is how it goes ac aha guidelines they address this functional capacity as a very important notorious factor but this canadian society guidelines they do not take that into consideration they directly go for nt pro bnp measurement or bnp measurement if nt pro bnp measurement is less than 300 and pro bnp measurement is less than 92 then troponin monitoring is not needed suppose if it was more and nt pro bnp levels more than 2000 is associated with increased risk of major adverse cardiac events and you can proceed to surgery if nt pro bnp levels are normal you can proceed to surgery with the increased risk if nt pro bnp levels are increased so canadian guidelines just avoids this uh, functional capacity and also they do not take this acs nsqip index into consideration they always consider only rcri as i told before only rcri considers troponin monitoring and nsqi uh, mean qs mean uh, nsqip did not consider any troponin monitoring and hence they are not used in the canadian guidelines so coming on to last subset which is risk reduction what risk am i talking about as maces myocardial infarction myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery stroke acute pulmonary embolism acute heart failure or severe significant arrhythmias and morbidity and mortality any risk will be patient risk as well as surgical risk that will give the total risk and in the surgical approach whenever your surgeon says i'll approach this patient laparoscopically you should happily wholeheartedly accept because these patients will do better with an vascular or endoscopic procedure or video assisted procedure than an open procedure and these patients at the level of risk reduction will always start from your perioperative assessment intraoperative management and post operative concerns as well so general risk reduction should include any non cardiac surgery coming for an elective case you should actually talk them to stop smoking for at least 4 weeks 
you can consider starting them on exercise program and also weight reduction is associated with some degree of betterment and whenever you are assessing patients with diabetes mellitus always try to bring the hpmc under control because before attempting for an elective high risk non cardiac surgery like less than 6.5 and optimize the blood pressures with ac inhibitors arbs beta blockers calcium channel blockers and all and control dyslipidemia with statins and in case of whether you are going for a time sensitive surgery as i told before if it's a time sensitive surgery consider balloon angioplasty and whenever the patient is having a thrombo a thrombotic risk as per a chadwick score or caprini score you always consider post operative thromboprophylaxis especially in hip and knee arthroscopic knee orthopedic patients and also in cancer patients and in the blood management you always evaluate look for hp values pre operatively itself and implement all measures that would have a implementation on blood conservation strategies like giving a like appropriate uh, bp like do not over do not have a hypertensive side have a correct bp correct the iron deficiency anemia pre op have a cell saver use tranexamic acid use point of care testing and a goal directed therapy for any fluid management and blood management whenever you are considering cardiac patients whenever their ef is low post it for moderate or high risk surgery consider invasive monitoring using intraarterial blood pressure and these are standard methods of care using temperature depth of anesthesia or standard what will probe for invasive measure is whenever they are going for intermediate or high risk procedure with the cardiac background a routine pulmonary artery catheter is not advised and tee can be done when there is a large fluid shift in a cardiac patients like liver transplant or massive again cabgs like that and there are no guidelines or available data that suggest that intravenous is better than volatile regional is better than general anesthesia no your point of optimization should be optimize hemodynamics reduce blood loss treat anemia never allow hyperthermia hypothermia which will increase the myocardial oxygen consumption your point should be to stick within to decrease the myocardial demand supply mismatch for better outcomes any patient who is having an intraoperative hypotension bp fall of more than 20% from the baseline if it is going to prolong for more than 20 minutes then it is going to have a worse outcome always look for the cause whether it is vasodilatation or hypovolemia or is it because of decreased inotropy all that you have to see and treat this is from a vision study uh, where they have seen the causes for myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery where heart rate more than 100 for at least 30 minutes is associated with increased odds of myocardial injury and heart rate less than 55 which is lasting for 60 minutes is associated with negative risk of mens and any bp of more than 160 for at least uh, 30 25 minutes is associated with increased risk of myocardial injury and bp less than 100 also is associated with increased risk of myocardial injury always try to optimize the demand supply mismatch by suppose if it was hypotension give fluids and vasopressors depending upon the cause if it was hypertension you rule out pain tachycardic uh, pain or uh, any cause that might or withholding the anti hypertensives if it's pain with tachycardia I mean hypertension with tachycardia you can load them with beta blockers if it is myocardial infarction which is confirmed in stemi or stemi with a troponin value you go for guideline directed therapy and if it's the persistent cardiogenic shock the patient is having persistent chest pain persistent cardiogenic shock you have loaded with noradrenaline still shock then you go for coronary angiography and how to mitigate the risk is starting them on anticoagulants antiplatelets and statins in the post operative period you always have a high degree of suspicion to rule out any uh, outcomes which would come like mi or <clears throat> acute pulmonary embolism like that and you address pain with multimodal analgesia for risk reduction because most of the myocardial injury is happening on the second day whenever they mobilize whenever the sympathetic drive is high whenever the pain is high like that and optimize the hemodynamic parameters heart rate blood pressure pre load after load and try to avoid nsaids if possible and if the pain is increasing in spite of 
um, your normal routine uh, regional anesthesia or uh, paracetamol, then you can think of uh, using NSAIDs and resume pre op drugs, especially AC inhibitors, beta, beta blockers. You will continue, especially AC inhibitors. Never stop, never think twice to start these drugs unless they are. And uh, when they have become hemodynamically okay, and always consider trauma prophylaxis in obese patients, cancer patients, and orthopedic patients. And in summary, decide on the perioperative strategy in a patient specific manner. Get a good rapport with your cardiologist and surgeon. Whenever you are writing a preoperative assessment, never write as cardiologist fitness for surgery. It is always, always cardiologist risk stratification for surgery. A cardiologist cannot come and tell you you need to take the case under spinal or GA. He cannot give you fitness. He can just say it is a moderate risk. It is a high risk. It is a very high risk based on the RCRA score. Whenever you're writing a high risk concern, you always give the RCRA score. Say this is the risk percentage of MACE. Thereby, you will also be protected in the court of law. Always get an informed high risk concern for any non-cardiac yeah. surgery and follow guideline directed therapy with the multidisciplinary approach and follow the best practice guidelines, maybe ACA guidelines or the current, um, Canadian Society guidelines, thereby reducing the risk. And this are the guidelines in which I've made um, topics from which I've taken from. I've taken this topic, read this topic extensively just to present this. Thank you. Sorry, I've taken so much amount of time. Um, thank you. It was excellent, excellent uh, opening with uh, the presentation. I think uh, postgraduate students will be really thankful to you for uh, clearing many of their day-to-day -day doubts. Uh, I request, uh, I think Professor Nagasami sir is with us and Dr. Shanti Malran, madam, our senior anesthesiologist are with us and they are uh, very much uh, part of this uh, session right from the very beginning. And uh, sir, thank I you, request sir to you, sir. give his uh, comments on uh, the session, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are very much audible, okay. sir. <laughs> thank you. And that was an excellent, elaborate the presentation suitable for a CME. Thank you, sir. That from uh, postgraduate point of view, who are uh, they? You have primary DNB students. You have uh, post DNB students. And uh, from their point of view, this is a question which is uh, repeatedly asked in the theory examination. <clears throat> so to write whatever uh, Dr. Sandhya has uh, elaborated for more than an hour and 45 minutes, it's impossible to write all the points. <clears throat> so uh, of course, for from a postgraduate teaching angle, I feel uh, it should be more concise because this knowledge is going to help. I think Sandhya is a cardiac anesthetist. Are you? I was, sir. Uh, so <laughs> I, I could see all that. Have you seen a fontan patient coming for yes. surgery? Yes, okay. sir, I have. So you have I a have. lot of experience all that uh, that is shown in your presentation. So uh, I have done fontans also. I have taken fontans for non cardiac surgeries also. I have taken two fontans for non cardiac surgeries. Excellent. That means uh, you have, uh, you are far ahead. Uh, we, uh, we as uh, oldies, we have never been exposed to cardiac anesthesia in such a uh, detailed manner. Uh, so, from the examination point of view, uh, if uh, you permit, I will just share my screen and show a few, uh, just three or four PPPs, which, which uh, we can, uh, we can uh, evaluate whether the students have understood all the points what you have uh, spoken for more than an hour and a half. Uh, can I share my screen, please? Thank you, sir. Please, sir. <clears throat> Is my screen visible? Is my screen visible? It's visible, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. So, uh, the topic we have discussed so far in this uh, one and a half hours or more is perioperative cardiovascular assessment for patients undergoing non cardiac surgery. 
So I would like uh, some of the postgraduate students who are here to unmute and uh, answer these questions. What are the common cardiac diseases which you encounter? Where a patient with cardiac disease uh, may come for a non-cardiac surgery. So myocardial infarction. Ischemic heart disease. Uh, arrhythmia. Ischemic heart disease, yeah. Myocardial, rather than saying myocardial infarction, you can say coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. Okay, then. But what was the first uh, uh, cardiac disease with which Dr. Sandhya started her discussion? Hypertension, sir. Commonly, hypertension. Long then ischemic heart disease. Then she went for valvular heart disease. So the common cardiac conditions are hypertension, IHP, congestive cardiac failure, valvular heart diseases, arrhythmias, and CMP or patients with uh, already implanted uh, uh, pacemakers. Okay, these are the common cardiac diseases which you encounter. And what are the three cardiac risk markers for these patients? LV dysfunction or myocardial ischemia or heart valve abnormality. Now the second question, what is the severity of the heart disease? How do you assess the severity of the heart disease? Is there any way you can assess the severity? We have listened to all the details, elaborate discussion by Dr. Sandhya, so very well given to you, the platter by this beautiful slides. So whether compensated or decompensated or whether it is mild, moderate or severe, okay? This is how you have to assess the severity of the heart disease. Then the third point is, what is the nature of the surgery? Isn't it? What non-cardiac surgery, it may be elective, urgent or emergent. These are the three things that she insisted upon. Or it may be high risk, moderate risk or low risk surgery. Can you tell me an example of a low risk surgery? So superficial surgeries like cataract uh, surgeries, breast cataract, surgeries. Ah, breast surgeries, okay. So these are all the nature. And what is the timing of surgery? This is where it becomes... Emergency. The elective, emergent, time specific or elective. Okay, this is the fourth point that you have to keep in mind. And what are the pre op examination and investigation needed to assess the patient, whether he is fit or he or she is fit for surgery or not? Protein blood investigations. Uh... Protein blood investigations, ECG, echo, ah, all that we have. Ah, objective examination include the evaluation of vital signs like blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, oxygen saturation, height, weight, and body mass index. And investigations like EKG, echo, stress test, blood test for BNP or troponin. Okay, so this is how the whole thing, uh, investigation demo is done. The next question is critical physical findings like thread, fourth heart sound, thralls, all these things you mentioned. Then what is the functional status of the patient? This is the sixth important point. So how do you assess the functional status? Clinically, we can do... Uh... Metabolic equivalence, you know, Mets, Mets and Duke's activity index. These are the two simplest things. If the patient, she already told, some patients say, I can go to the restroom and come back without dyspnea. Some other patient says, I will be dyspneic even when I attempt to go to the restroom. Okay, so that is the simplest method of assessing. Or you can even ask the patient a few questions and if you can talk four sentences without becoming breathless, that is a very good sign of uh, compensated uh, function. And then come the risk assessment. How do you assess the risk? What are all the scoring systems you use? RCRI scores. Ah, RCRI, RCRI NS2A, and MICA. These are the risk assessment systems. So what are the details that they involve in? And what is the current drug therapy and any need for modification? This is the next question that you have to. So what are all the drugs you are worried about? Or which you think will be interfering with the anesthesia part of it? AC inhibitors, ARB AC inhibitors, ARBs, okay, beta blockers, high dose of aspirins, and P2 white blood inhibitors. Uh. Okay, so this is the eighth point that you have to remember. 
Any interventional procedures required before the planned surgery? Elective angio CAGs, balloon angio or pacemaker insertion, which may be required before the planned surgery in case if it is a severe arrhythmia, if you have the time. And of course, all depends on whether the surgery is uh, urgent, emer emergent, urgent, or elective. Okay, based on that only, you are going to do that. And what are all the level of evidence for each and everything? This is what you have to finally answer in this. So if you remember these 10 points and elaborate them on that, you can finish your answer writing for this question within 15 to 20 minutes maximum. Okay. But of course, you have to remember whatever points she has told about, but these are the major uh, 10 points or 10 commandments if you have to remember. And of course, these are all, if you have time, you can write these steps of uh, this thing and then the class of recommendations and then the flow chart with which you say decide what you want to do and clinical predictors of preoperative myocardial infarction based on the type of uh, the patient that which is classified into major, intermediate, and minor. And uh, so in the evaluation, you can just uh, uh, stop with how do you, what drugs you withhold, what drugs you continue. And in time, if the time is very short, how you have to manage the bleeding versus thrombotic risk in patients who are prone for those things. And what is the increased level of monitoring required when the patient is at a very high risk? These are all the points that you have to remember. So if you remember these points, I think you will be able to manage this question within the given time. And uh, again, I should uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Sandhya for that uh, beautiful presentation. And uh, I, of, of course, uh, I don't know whether my summarizing the whole uh, lecture of an hour and 45 minutes into these 10 commandments will help the students or not that uh, the speaker has to <laughs> tell me her opinion about it. You have to unmute uh, Sandhya, your mic is muted. Now I'm thinking I should have made only 10 slides, sir. Only 10 <laughs> commandments. Pranath <laughs> is no, speaking for uh, one hour, I, 40 I, minutes. I always <laughs> think in, the, in terms of the junior most postgraduate, he should be able to have a clear concept of what we are talking because he, his first hazard is to pass his examination. For that, he should have a clear concept and uh, he should be able to impress the examiners both in theory as well as in his practical uh, examination that he knows the basic fundamentals. And uh, talking too much elaborate about uh, things uh, for the uh, novices, uh, I think, will be too heavy for them. Not that they, did, they should not know that, but it will not make them uh, have a clear uh, idea as to uh, which one they give, should give priority. Okay. So if you make it simple like that, yes. uh, what are the common cardiac conditions? Then how do you go about addressing the risk and the, the severity of that? Then what are the risk factors? Like that, uh, these are the 10 questions which came to my mind. And I put it in the, the slide form so that uh, they can have a, a easy method of writing their answer in the theory paper. Okay. okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank are you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. You, UG, POG, uh, UG, PG, both, uh, both I did from Madurai only. Sir. Okay. Dr. Ganesh I'm Prabhu also, was my I am also a Madurai graduate uh, way back in 1965. <laughs> so, <laughs> would not have been born at the time. So yes, sir. I am very happy. I finished in 2017, sir. Huh? <laughs> I finished in 2017, sir. 17? Okay. Right. One seven. Uh, Dr. Ganesh Prabhu was my uh, HOD. Oh, okay, Ganesh Prabhu. Okay. The Brunella was not there in the picture at all when I was there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you very much, much, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, any doubts from students? Yes. Uh, students uh, want to uh, ask Sir, uh, can I ask a small question, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have a small doubt. If a patient is on a prosthetic valve and he's on either warfarin or acetrome, and mm -hmm. we are bridging them with uh, low molecular weight heparin, mm -hmm. uh, 
we should stop this bridging therapy with uh, like 24 hours before 24 hours or 12 hours before surgery ma'am if like, the patient it is considered as a prophylactic right. or a therapeutic prophylactic dose only they would give mostly nowadays they don't bridge at all if it is like valve is more than one year now they don't bridge at all suppose if they are giving uh, if it is unfractionated heparin stop only six hours if it's low molecular weight heparin if the cardiologist prefers to give it as a bd dose stop 24 hours prior if the cardiologist gives only a prophylactic dose of 60 OD, you can stop 12 hours prior. Most of the cardiologists now know they don't bridge at all if it's AVR. Only for mechanical NVR, they actually think of bridging. That too, if it is less than uh, for three to four years or so. I have taken up a case where I have not bridged at all, <coughs> bringing warfarin, I mean, bringing the INR to subtherapeutic levels. Because there are no guidelines to say that whenever you bridge, like that was an European guideline which I, which I mentioned, but um, provided you bridge, do you expect a better outcome in terms of arterial thromboembolism? No, but for mechanical MVR, it's always better to bridge is what is my concern. I would discuss it with the cardiologist directly. So at least we can keep a prophylactic dose of uh, low molecular weight happen. So if you keep it, stop 12 hours prior. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to add one point, madam. In case uh, we are not bridging, uh, we should have a high degree of uh, suspicion for a stuck valve in the immediate post-operative period for 48 hours. Yeah. So closely monitor the patients for any new onset of uh, rhythm problems or symptoms, or if clinical indications are there, go for an echo. Yeah. Also, you if at all the patient is on a prosthetic valve, you also like within less than six months following a mitral valve replacement, Always have a word with your cardiologist that stopping this may have a thrombotic risk in the prosthetic valve, and you may not be able to revive the patient once the patient develops it. We had one such occasion in a uh, famous corporate hospital in Palatur where uh, following a double valve replacement, the consent for the high risk consent for the prosthetic valve uh, thrombus was not obtained. But then the patient developed thrombus in the interim period and uh, had to succumb to the prosthetic valve thrombus because it's not going to revert any prosthetic valve thrombus when you're stuck. So whenever you are taking up a case less than one year following mitral valve re replacement, have a high degree of suspicion. Always put in a word that at least 1% risk of thrombus may be there like that. Let me save your skin at some days, I mean, at any point of time. Yes, ma'am. Very true. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Risha. Yeah, I thank, thank Professor you, and I thank Santimalaya and I personally thank Dr. Guru Sanjay Madam for giving such a wonderful presentation and Sarah has already complimented that it's a PG postgraduate CME lecture. Of course, it's uh, very useful for all even freelancing anesthetists also. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, even our YouTube upload also will invite a lot of uh, positive applause for uh, Dr. Guru Sanjay. And uh, you, over you. and above our efforts, Professor Sarah has all of a sudden has given a creamy uh, delight for uh, all the students uh, by adding his 10 commandments to this presentation. It's such a wonderful uh, gift for us, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and you. I personally th <laughs> and I personally thank all the students for being with us and taking part in this presentation so actively. Thank you. Can we okay. sign up this meeting, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir.